my privilege this morning to get to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Gary Hollingsworth. Dr. Hollingsworth is the executive director of the South Carolina Baptist Convention. Uh, prior to that, he served throughout, as a pastor throughout churches throughout South in the Southeast. And so, but he has currently been as the executive director for the last six years, mm-hmm. I believe, at South in uh, for South Carolina. And it's just done a tremendous job serving the churches of South Carolina. And so we are so thrilled and excited to have you with us this morning. Uh, I think the only thing negative I could say about him is he's an Alabama fan. And so other than that, we are extremely excited to have you here. Would you welcome Dr. Gary Hollingsworth to Brushy Creek? Thank you, Benji. Well, thank you there, Benji. As a matter of fact, this morning, when I um, get that out of the way so I won't knock it over later, but uh, Benji took me to Pastor Corey's office and uh, for just a few moments, last uh, couple moments of some uh, time of reflection before the first service. And so uh, I was seated there and about to, to spend a couple minutes in prayer. And I looked up and here's this Auburn thing right in front of me. And I couldn't pray. That's all I can say. So I'm just, just kidding, just kidding. So, yeah, it is true. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an Alabama fan, but Pastor Corey and I, we're friends anyway. But I do want to say thank, uh, thanks to your pastor. Thanks to your wonderful staff, Benji. Thank you for your great hospitality. And, David, man, what a great morning of worship we've had. And, uh, you know, uh, I know what it's like on a Sunday morning as a pastor. And you come in, and things aren't exactly as you had hoped. And the weather is kind of nasty and bad. And the pastor is away on vacation. And it's raining. So I just want to say, I'm glad you're here this morning. We're going to have a great time around God's Word. And I do want to say to uh, Brushy Creek as a whole, I've been here uh, before. It's been some time, but y- y'all are, Brushy Creek is really one of our our premier influencing churches out of 2,125 churches that we have here in South Carolina, uh, South Carolina Baptist churches. Uh, you are always in the top tier in terms of your giving through the corporate program. Those funds that you give a portion come through our office, and we don't really keep them. We send them on to other ministries, uh, not the least of which there are about 3,500 uh, Southern Baptist missionaries serving somewhere around the, the world this very morning. And uh, they're there because of churches like Brushy Creek. There, I could spend the rest of our time, and I won't do that, but just uh, outlining all of the, the many wonderful things, no matter what you hear in the secular world, the secular media and social media about Southern Baptist and all the issues and challenges, and, and there are some that we certainly uh, try to deal with and need to deal with and will deal with, but at the same time, uh, we're focused on winning the world uh, to Jesus in the sharing of the gospel. So I want to thank you for being a huge, huge part of that. I also want to thank you sort of in advance. Uh, I asked Pastor Gory what he'd been preaching, uh, and uh, it, was there anything particular that he might want me to try to hit thematically and he said no just preach what God uh, has put on your heart and uh, so for some really months not just weeks now God has has really been dealing with me about this message I I had not preached it anywhere uh, until here this morning and uh, it is a message though sort of birthed out of a lot of questions that I get as I travel around the state and really around the nation um, and, and people asking me questions along this line. What in the world is going on? You know, what's your perspective on this or that or the other? And, uh, and so this message is really born out of, out of fielding a lot of those questions. And, and so the, the theme this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and open with me to Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. But that's really just going to be our jumping off passage. And we're going to talk about this... Uh, a, a difficult theme I've just simply entitled no one said it would be easy no one said that living uh, this Christian life particularly these days no one said that that it was going to be an easy journey and uh, we're going to find biblical affirmations to that but we're also going to find some some biblical hope towards the end of this message so I pray that you'll sort of stay with me if you will until we get to that end when we're really going to find out well is there really a purpose and meaning in all of these trials and persecutions and sufferings and tribulations and things that that we are going through and that the church has always gone through the answer is yes and we're going to find that this morning in the word of God so 
uh, would you be so kind and reverent with me to stand in honor of our God and the reading of his word. And I'd like to read for us this morning. I'll be reading from the ESV translation version of the scripture, Acts chapter 4, uh, beginning there in verse 1. You follow along as I read. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, they, they came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them. And they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those, and listen to this last verse, talk about the purpose of suffering and persecution, but many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men, just the men, came to about 5,000. May God enrich our lives as we share and have read from his word this morning. Thank you, and you may be seated. In the year 1563, a man by the name of John Fox wrote a book that amazingly is still in publication today. Now, you can go on Amazon, you, you can Google it, and find out more about it, but you can purchase a copy today of this book written in 1563. And the name of the book is simply referred to as Fox's Book of Martyrs. There's actually a more formal title that's so long I can't even remember it, but it's known as Fox's Book of Martyrs. And John Fox uh, began to collect both biblical stories of martyrdom and suffering and persecution and he added to it uh, up to that point historical documentation of those who had ultimately given their life as martyrs now the word martyr you may be familiar but the biblical word martyr literally translated is the turns into the word witness so if you're ever called to a court of law and if you're a witness you're really a martyr in that regard well, now we use it in a different way today but the word means that we're going to testify of something that we know to be factually true. And so really, when we think about what it really means to be a martyr, biblically, it means that it should lead us as Christ followers, if you are, if, if indeed you're a Christ follower, to give evidence, testimonial evidence, of that which you experientially know to be true. Now, while we think that martyrdom and persecution and suffering is something that is far away and historically that it's way back then, well, I, I would share with you that it's very, very real today. As a matter of fact, Kayla Mueller, back in August of 2013, just about nine years ago, then she was 26 years of age, she was a devout Christian and felt a call of God to go in a humanitarian way and to go over into the Middle Eastern areas of the world and begin to serve as a relief worker. And she was very convictional not only about her faith but also about helping people who are suffering in so many ways. Well, she was kidnapped in Syria in 2013 by ISIS terrorists and after 16 long months of imprisonment and unimaginable torture and abuse. She was killed by her captors, the ISIS terrorists, on February the 6th of 2015, just seven years or so ago. And, and so I, I say that to say that it's very much alive and it's not quite as far away from us as we might think. As a matter of fact, in less brutal ways and in less stark ways, but we are probably most familiar that in recent days that we've had everybody from bakers and florists who've been sued because they refused to participate in weddings where they would have had to compromise their biblical convictions about marriage. And uh, a University of California intern, a young lady lost her job there because she dared to share Jesus on her own time and off campus, but someone was offended that she had talked about Jesus with them, and she was let go. There was an Atlanta fire chief who was fired because he led Bible studies and because he actually published a book on biblical manhood, but that was not sufficient, and so he was let go. And even closer to our own home, and in just the last couple of weeks, Anderson University, Dr. Evans Whitaker, dear friend of mine, we work very closely with him in his administration, but they're under fire right now because 
they failed to renew a contract of an adjunct drama teacher who publicly broke clear rules of conduct which she signed when she was hired but because they did not renew the contract now they're under fire calling it discrimination on and on and on we could go it is very real and it is very close as a matter of fact one national publication reports this that in a typical month the average month around the world 255 Christians are killed for their faith 104 every month are abducted 180 Christian women are abused because they're Christian 66 churches around the world per average on every month are attacked and 160 Christians monthly are detained without trial and sent to prison yeah, it it is indeed very real and very current well I, I we just want to take a few moments now and walk through again some biblical realities that will perhaps educate us a little bit we hope to encourage us a whole lot and even set the stage for what is it that God can and does do to use these things when they happen so let's begin first of all by just simply talking about the reality of persecution now these introductory stories are not enough but let's talk about the biblical realities because see when when we hear of these things today and even in the cultural shifts and changes that are taking place and have been taking place at a very rapid pace over the last few years especially often our response as Christ followers uh, can be anger or defensiveness but the truth of the matter is is that the Word of God tells us that we should not be shocked nor surprised at this reality of persecution for example in the Sermon on the Mount Matthew chapter 5 the very early portion of that message from the Lord Jesus he shares these words Matthew 5 10 and 11 blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you even falsely on my account and then the Apostle Peter also affirms this reality in 1 Peter chapter 4 beginning in verse 12 he says it this way beloved uh, do not be surprised at when that fiery trial it comes upon you to test you as though something strange has happened to you no but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed and if you're insulted for the name of Christ you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer and I, in, this is interesting or as a meddler no I won't even chase that rabbit but there it is he said yet if anyone suffers as a Christian let them not be ashamed but let them glorify God in that name and then the uh, Apostle Paul follows up as well in his instruction to young pastor Timothy when he writes these words in 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, Paul tells Timothy, all who have a desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He didn't say might be persecuted, might be, could potentially face, no, will be persecuted. So we see this affirmation biblically of the fact that as Christ followers we are to expect it now our country we just celebrated our birthday last week did we not and for 240 plus years we have enjoyed and still enjoy and we really still do enjoy being the, the most free nation on the planet and if there's ever any wonder why thousands upon thousands of people every day are coming to our borders trying to get in it is because they can find freedom here this is still with all of our flaws and all of our issues and all of our challenges and I'm, I'm not a just a Christian patriot when I'm saying this but it, it we have lived and basked in that marvelous thing called freedom and liberty but I would add this someone has said it well about particular Christians over these 240 plus years and here's the word that we have become lazy in our liberty we've gotten lazy in our liberty we enjoy this liberty that we've had and now suddenly that liberty is beginning to sort of shrink around us and 
And, and I, I don't know that that's a bad thing because it's going to challenge us perhaps in some ways that we need to be challenged and we've not been challenged in a long, long time. No, there is the reality of persecution. But secondly, I want to talk with you for a moment about the various forms of persecution. Now, we'll find these biblically. All of these are found in the Scripture, so let's just talk about uh, what does the Bible say? How might persecution and suffering come in our lives? Well, the first one uh, is verbal. There, there are times where we experience verbal persecution. In that passage, uh, Jesus said in Matthew five eleven, when we find that word uh, that people will revile us, the word revile there simply means abusive, aggressive, hostile, vile speech against someone. Now, having grown up in Alabama, uh, I'm going to put it in the Alabama vernacular of what I understand, and maybe you will hear uh, in the state of South Carolina, and I'll say, it. have you ever been cussed out? Anybody got a witness out there, okay? You, you know what that feels like? I do. I played football. Let me tell you what. I, I had a coach in high school who was a great football coach, and uh, I played a little bit in college, and I had some wonderful coaches at that level, and uh, they were great football coaches, but some of them were just vile, and um, I know what it's like to take a good cussing from a coach because they're trying to motivate, trying to encourage. I, I know what that feels like. Well, I tell you that by way of illustration to say that's what Jesus said. Don't be surprised that as a follower of Jesus that people are going to revile you and utter all kinds of evil against you. And he even says falsely on my account. Now listen, there's a whole lot of verbal persecution going on today with a lot of falsehoods. You know, we hear the politicians talk about fake news and false news and all of those kinds of things. And let me just say it this way. These wonderful things that we carry in our pockets and have on our bodies, the smartphones, although they're not always that smart, that's what I've discovered. I, I argue a lot with my GPS. Do y'all have discussions with your GPS lady like I do? I, I, I travel this state, and sometimes we just have to have a little conversation. But let me just say this, particularly as Christ followers. You see, just because we can read something or even post something on social media does not give any of us a pass to use godless gossip against something if we know it's not to be true. And, and there's a lot of that going on today, even within the Christian community, even within our little Southern Baptist world. And we have to learn how to filter those. There's a possibility, though, that we may experience verbal forms of persecution. Secondly, obviously, the most notable would be physical. That's what happened to Kayla Mueller. That's what has happened to over 300, by the way. You go to the International Mission Board and their Missionary Learning Training Center in Richmond, Virginia. And I, I, I'd, I'd never seen this until just about a year and a half ago and I was up there and they have a wall of martyrs. And I, I was just, I did not know that in our 175 plus years of Southern Baptist missions that we've had over 300 of our missionaries who've been killed on the field and died. I, that staggered me. And there's a wall with their names on it there at the Missionary Learning Center. So there is a very real possibility. The Apostle Paul even kind of gives a little bit of a resume, if I can call it that, uh, in Acts uh, chapter, uh, I mean in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And here's what Paul says about himself. Five times I received the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A d night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And I love this last line. Brother Ralph Carter was in the first service, so I kind of pointed this at, at, at Dr. Carter when I said this, having been the pastor here for many, many years. And if Corey were here, I'd affirm it to him as well. And Paul says, and as if all of that weren't enough, he says, verse 28, and apart from all these other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. I, I said, does that mean that being a pastor is sort of like taking a beating? I don't know if there's a correlation there or not. But it probably feels that way sometimes, too, 
a pastor, I understand. Paul said there could come times in our life where we're going to experience not death, maybe not martyrdom in that regard, but we're going to pay a price physically. But there's a third form that most of us, this will get a little closer to home, and that's relational. There is a, there is a, a notion of relational persecution. How say? Well, it means that you may lose some friends or even family members when you became a Christian, uh, or as you begin to grow in your faith, you, you may experience some relational form of persecution. We have a, a man on our staff at, at our convention in Columbia who grew up in a very godless home, godless environment, became a Christian as a college student, it, uh, then was called to the ministry, planted a church, incredibly successful evangelistically. But when he became a Christ follower, his entire family just abandoned him still has no relationship with any of his family why because he's experienced relational persecution most muslim background believers particularly whereas people who have grown up in a muslim background and become christ followers almost every single one of them that i know anything about and i've known some but they will be ostracized by family and friends in their community and, and even me personally when I, I was saved when I was a little boy, but I started growing in my faith when I was about 16 years of age. And when I really became serious about the Scripture and my walk with Christ, I lost some friends. We, we kind of went our separate ways because as I grew in my faith and they didn't understand that, we just grew apart. There was a relational cost that was paid. But there's this final one I want to mention this morning, at least under this, these forms, and that's financial. I believe that this is going to be one, by the way, that is going to grow exponentially in coming days. Uh, I've already mentioned the intern uh, in California who lost her job because she shared, dared to share Christ. I, I mentioned you know, the cake bakers and the florists and others who have it's cost them financially. But it could very well cost you, maybe not your job, but you may not get that promotion that you thought you deserved or you've been working so hard for. Or you may not get that callback interview when you applied for a job, particularly if you've taken a stand on biblical convictions. If you have a biblical worldview of how you see life and you're, you dare speak in the public arena about that. When I was pastoring in Alabama, uh, one of my, our deacons, he was a manager of a retail outlet, a uh, national retail store, and they wanted to begin to sell alcohol in that store, and that was certainly their, the owners had the prerogative of doing that, but they came to, to our deacon friend and said, uh, we'll need a local liquor license, and we want you to sign the application for the, applica for the liquor license, and, and he refused because he had a biblical con a conviction, a strong conviction, and so they fired him, and I remember the day he came to my office and he said, well, I, I, I've, I've been fired. I've just lost my job. And I was kind of reaching out to him and trying to console him. And he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, I'm, I'm not worried about it at all. God will give me another job. And he did. But he paid a financial price because he dared stand for a conviction. So, again, we don't have to be in Fox's Book of Martyrs to go very far to understand that we're living in an increasingly hostile world to a biblical worldview. Now, that's been all the heavy news, the bad news. I want to take these last few minutes, though, to help us and perhaps be encouraged because here it is. There, there is a purpose in persecution, the purpose of persecution. Uh, this is not something that's going to happen to you or to me or to us uh, and, and be in vain. And so I just want to suggest three, particularly based on scriptural affirmations, Three things that God will do if you begin to suffer any kinds of these forms of suffering or persecution. The first one is it will help you grow in Christ-likeness. Persecution and suffering, according to the Bible, is a guarantee that you're going to be more like Jesus. As a matter of fact, listen how Paul says it in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29. When he's speaking again to the church there at Philippi, and he says it this way, this way, For it has been granted to you, and listen to this, for the sake of Christ, that you not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. 
In other words, Paul's telling the Philippian Christians who were going through a tough time, by the way, when he wrote that to them, and Paul himself was going through a tough time. He was actually in prison when he wrote this. And he was like, hey, don't, don't, don't worry so much about this because you're going to grow in Christ's likeness because you're suffering for his name's sake. You're suffering because you're a follower. And go back to 1 Peter chapter 4, that lengthy passage I read earlier. But in there, when the Apostle Peter says it this way, if you are abused, here it is again, for the name of Christ, blessed are you. And the spirit of glory and of God's rest is upon you. Now, we normally would not associate persecution, trial, suffering, pain, tribulation. We would never associate that with being blessed and the spirit of God being upon us. But it's there. Why? Because we're actually, God's using that to help us be more like Jesus. I can't even think of a way to be more like Jesus than being persecuted because they put him, an innocent man, totally, ultimately on a cruel Roman cross on your behalf and my behalf, and we identify with that. I, I also think of, of the, the passage in Acts chapter 7 about Stephen, the first New Testament person that we know who gave his life um, as a martyr. He was stoned with the Apostle Paul you'll remember, standing nearby, not only giving affirmation, but, uh, but was a part of that persecution movement against the church before Paul had his Damascus Road experience and came to be a Christ follower himself. I'm actually convinced that Paul seeing Stephen dying for his faith made a tremendous impact on him, maybe an image he could not get out of his mind. Why? Because listen to verse 55 of Acts chapter 7. As Stephen is taking his last few breaths on this earth, here's what the Bible says. But he, Stephen, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it says that gazed up into heaven and he saw the glory of God. And what else did he see? Jesus standing at the right hand of of God. What a picture of Stephen seeing Jesus in all of his glory because he was being a whole lot like Jesus. You'll grow in your Christ likeness. Another purpose, though, this is similar but a little different from just growing in Christ likeness. But the second thing that happens is growth in our Christian character. Growth in our Christian character. What, what do we mean by that? And, and what's the difference? Well, Romans chapter 5. Verses 3 and 4 give what I like to call a, a formula of how to develop your Christian character. And there are kind of links in a chain that get put on each of these building upon the other. And, and persecution, as you'll see, suffering is a part of that. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 5, 3 and 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that, and here are the links, suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope you see how all that works together so the next time you're going through something maybe somebody speaks critically of you because you're a Christ follower or speaks against you because you've taken a very biblical stand on something that is clearly counter culture it may very well be that you don't take that in some sort of smart alecky kind of way. Well, I'm just going to be the martyr here. And I know, no, 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 no. But with all humility, you come and say, God, how are you developing my Christian character so that I might really have hope in this world? I, I love the, world that it, the word that is used here. That word endurance means strength under pressure. I, I, uh, having played some football and some sports in my past life years ago, uh, weight training is a very important part of that. And even if you're not an athlete, uh, which I'm certainly not anymore, but just trying to stay in shape a little bit, the older that we get, we work out. And here's the deal, uh, wor working out, I haven't found a way yet that it's fun. And now some of y'all, I know there are a handful of you who love to work out. I love the results of working out. I've yet 
to find a day that I'm just excited about it. You, you, you with me? But what happens if you're lifting weights or when you're working out is that you're putting your body through some pain at that moment because you believe that there's going to be a payout, a payoff later on. I love what Vince Lombardi, the great NFL football coach, uh, some of y'all know his name, others uh, from a younger generation may not remember him quite so much, coached the uh, Green Bay Packers uh, in the first few Super Bowls as that, all that was getting started in the 60s. But here was his quote. He, he said, my job is to make grown men do what they hate doing in order to see the dream of their lifetime become reality. Isn't that true? You know, making grown men do things they didn't want to do. There's the pain. There's the suffering, if you will. But to experience the dream of doing what they've always wanted to do, to win a Super Bowl or whatever. Well, if that's true in football, oh, it's much more true in our Christian journey. God will develop our Christian character and sometimes use persecution and suffering to do it. But the final thing, and we close with this, this may be the pinnacle of it all. What's the purpose in suffering? Well, we already saw a little of it in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, but here it is. It leads to powerful gospel witness. Just read the book of Acts. The book of Acts is nothing more than a chronicle of the early church, and suffering and persecution is almost on every page. And then history records that every time the church suffers in some way through persecution, the gospel spreads. It's happening today in Iran, believe it or not, in China, believe it or not, even in North Korea, believe it or not. The gospel is expanding, and every time persecution increases, so does evangelism. As a matter of fact, sadly, America is one of the few countries in the world today who's not doing very well evangelistically. You know, we're concerned with the economy, we're concerned with who's in the White House, and we're concerned with all of these issues, and they're important. Yes, I get that they're important, but the reality is, is that God says, I'm, I may be doing something bigger that you can't see with human eyes, and that is evangelistic success. I'm going to skip this last passage of Scripture for the sake of time because I, I want to close this morning with this thought. You know, I really do believe with all of my heart that America is ripe for revival. And you say, How, what? Don't you see what's going on? Yeah, I see exactly what's going on. Why would I say that? Well, historically, in our country, over the 240 plus years, is that about every 60 years on average, we have had some kind of national spiritual awakening. The last one was in the 1970s. It was called the Jesus Movement. That's when I graduated from high school, 1975. I was actually called into ministry. That's where my growth spurt really came from, is this spiritual awakening that was going on in our country. Uh, again, you, you can read about all of these great moments of awakening in our country and on average about every 60 years as the cycle goes is that there is some kind of, a, of an awakening and biblically and historically you'll always find certain conditions existing just prior to a turnaround and a spiritual awakening and let me just simply say every one of those conditions preconditions exists in America right now that's why I'm so encouraged by that but how is it going to take place is, is it going to take place well there's a sovereign piece of that that just God is God and he's going to do what he will do but there is a role to be played by you and by me every great movement of God nationally has come out of prayer of God's people just the praying of God's people so I would ask you how seriously are you praying for revival and for spiritual awakening? I close with this historic illustration of why I believe God can use you and God can use me if we will take this seriously. John Chrysostom was one of the early church fathers. He lived from 347 to 407 A.D., so just 300, 400 years after Christ. And he was a very vocal Christian uh, in his day and age. 
As a matter of fact, uh, there was a, a, a state church that had emerged by that time, and Chris Oslin saw a lot of the abuses inside the church and, and, and preached a pure form of the gospel and paid a high price for it. As a matter of fact, so much so that he was arrested and he was brought before the emperor at that time, the emperor of Rome. And the emperor looked John Chrysostom in the eye and he said, Chrysostom, I'm going to banish you from this country if you don't stop preaching this gospel. And Chrysostom looked at him and he said, Sir, you cannot banish me because the whole world belongs to my father. So you can't banish me. And so then the emperor, frustrated, said, Well, I'm going to take away all your property." Don't think that that couldn't happen in America. I'm going to take away your property. And Chris Austin looked at me and says, Oh, well, with all due respect, sir, my treasures are in heaven. And so you can't take away my property. I have none. And then he, he said, Well, I, I'm going to take you to a place where there will be no one who will even speak to you. You'll not have a friend. And he said, Well, sir, that doesn't bother me because I have a friend who is closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. And then he finally said, I'm going to take away your life. I'll kill you, which was a real possibility. And he said, well, if that happens, he said, that's okay because my life is hid with God in Christ Jesus. And you know what the emperor finally said when Chris Oslem had these replies? The emperor even looked at his attendants and threw up his arms, and history records that he said, what can I do with a man like this? I just want you all to know, the world won't know what to do with a man or a woman today who will live that kind of conviction with Jesus Christ. What can they do to us? Martin Luther had a pretty good idea when he wrote it in a hymn that he wrote, The Body They May Kill. Who knows the next line in that song? If you know it, say it out loud. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. Take away my life. Take away my property. Take away everything we have and even the emperor, what can we do with a man like that? Be that man. Be that woman. Be that church, Brushy Creek. And by God's grace, I pray that God will let me live long enough. I'll be 65 in just a few months, okay? I pray God's going to let me live long enough to see revival come again in this nation. I want to be a part of it. Absolutely. Give God glory in that.